Good morning. It's good to see you this morning. We're glad you're here today. Welcome. And uh, let's stand together and let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Proverbs, chapter 30 this morning. Proverbs chapter 30. If you're with us this morning without a Bible, and uh, just flag one of these guys coming up the aisle right now, and they'll put one in your hand, mark to the passage we're studying today. If you don't own a Bible, we want everybody to own a Bible, and God wants you to as well. Make that a gift uh, from Him to you today. A reminder, on Sunday nights we go through the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, currently studying uh, the book of Romans on Sunday night, 6 o'clock. Uh, each of you are invited. Proverbs chapter 30. The words of Agur, the son of Jacob, uh, his utterance. This man declared to Ithiel, to Ithiel and Ukal, Surely I am more stupid than any man, and do not have the understanding of a man. I neither learned wisdom, nor have knowledge of the Holy One. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the wind in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name, if you know? Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. Do not add to his words, lest he rebuke you and you be found a liar. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the good work that you're doing in each of our lives. Um, we can guess on some level, but you're the only one that really understands what is required in all of our uh, fallenness, though now redeemed, and all of what we are, what's required to conform us into the image of your Son. But we're so thankful that you do it. We're so thankful that there's someone who can. Thank you for the life that unfolds. We pray, Lord, that you would use this passage that we study this morning as in all of the Bible and the unique place that it plays, these verses, in further equipping us unto every good work as your children. And we ask for this work of your Spirit in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. So this morning we continue our Sunday morning series entitled Timeless Wisdom, a topical series through the book of Proverbs. Obviously as we get to chapter 30 now, we realize we're coming toward the end of the series, though I think it'll take us the better part of the summer um, to uh, finish it up. In these final two chapters of the book of Proverbs, we notice that uh, the wisdom that is being imparted to us here by the Holy Spirit through Solomon, that ends in chapter 29. And now in chapters 30 and 31, God ministers this wisdom of his through uh, two different human instruments. A man named Agur in verse uh, chapter 30, and then a king by the name of Lemuel in chapter 31. Concerning Agur, who is the human instrument God used in writing these verses in the chapter we'll continue to study, uh, it's the only mention of him in the Bible. Uh, we don't know anything else about him except for what's contained here uh, in this very first uh, verse. We don't know anything more <coughs> about him than the wisdom that he imparts to us through the remainder of the chapter. His uh, historical identity is really not important uh, to us. He knows that. He knows that what's really important about him and what he wants us to know is this, that he writes, and what he writes, he writes here, uh, is given as an utterance, you notice in verse 1. That is, it's an utterance from God, uh, that what he is speaking here is uh, divinely inspired. The King James Version captures this, the divine authority with which uh, uh, Agur speaks. It, it, it puts it this way, the words of Agur, the son of uh, Jacob, even the prophecy, uh, the man spake unto Ithiel and so forth. And so that same Hebrew word uh, and utterance is pro uh, translated elsewhere in the Bible as prophecy, translated as uh, a burden, and a burden being a very common reference in the Old Testament to 
a message, a prophecy that God has given to uh, a prophet of some kind. He imparts this wisdom to, we don't really know whether he imparts this wisdom to two sons of his or two students uh, of his named Ithiel and Ukal. And uh, so if you haven't, uh, if you are with child and you haven't yet figured out a name that you're looking for and uh, um, something unusual, you say, I doubt there'll be another uh, uh, Ukal in the first grade class, uh, I can uh, commend uh, these three to you for your consideration. The brevity of his introduction reveals a man, and this is uh, dear to my heart, it, it reveals a man who is much more eager to declare the Word of God uh, than to talk about himself. And so he introduces himself virtually by name, letting us know that this is what he speaks is now by divine inspiration, and then he quickly moves on to verse 2. And I always find that refreshing uh, in a Bible teacher. In verse 2, we have Agur's candid uh, expression of his own innate uh, ignorance in life, and it is an ignorance that's shared by every man, woman, and child who is born uh, into the world. You can't help but be struck by Agur's use of the S word here, his use of the word stupid. And it's so important to the passage that I've entitled the message, uh, The Cure for Stupid. And before you start thinking about uh, all of the people who you think would be greatly uh, helped by the message, let them know there's a cure for your condition. He doesn't write this, Agur doesn't, for us to do that, but for us to realize there's a a cure for our condition. When Karen and I were raising our daughters, uh, this was a word which we and uh, many other parents at that time, we forbade our children to uh, speak it uh, to one another, and they were not allowed to uh, call one another stupid. But it's one thing to use the word as a slur, slur or to use it as a weapon. It's another thing to use it as Agur does here uh, academically, uh, to use it with precision, to use it with accuracy, because it's the best word that a person can find then to describe uh, oneself or another person. And do notice that Agur declares himself to be stupid uh, in the passage. He isn't calling... Uh, anyone else stupid directly, but uh, he gently is helping anyone who hears kind of his uh, self-assessment and then uh, discovers that we are in uh, his same shoes in life, that then we would make this same assessment uh, of our lives that he has made of his life. And, uh, and this is, of course, quite brilliant in imparting truth. So it's kind of like he's talking with somebody and he says, you know, once I was so stupid as to believe, and then he begins to say what it is that he's going to say, and the person that he's talking to believes those very things. But he hasn't assessed stupidity to the person, but to himself. But we get the drift when that happens and is very effective for making us all ears for why do you consider this stupid and what moved you from that stupidity? Because I'm not going to say anything, but I happen to be firmly entrenched in this particular stupidity in life. The Hebrew word that Agur uses and is translated stupid in the English translation of the Bible that I use, the New King James, it literally means stupid, but it carries the idea of being brutish, uh, of being like an animal, uh, to live uh, on the level of an animal, to live as a brute uh, beast. It's to be as dull-minded as a cow. The word is used elsewhere repeatedly in the Old Testament Uh, to describe uh, cows. Now, we like cows. Uh, We think they're cute, and they certainly are tasty. But I have never known anyone to envy them their life. 
or to envy a cow their intellectual uh, prowess. You never see anyone engaged in any kind of a serious conversation uh, with a cow. So anybody can look at a cow from the vantage point of being a human being and conclude that while it's perfectly okay for a cow to live like a cow, it would be a tragedy for a human being to live on the level of a cow. And the point that Agur is making is that on some level, he and every other human being in the world uh, is capable uh, of exactly that, living on the level of an animal in life. As I was preparing this message, uh, a couple of lines of a couple songs uh, from my childhood and youth uh, surfaced as, as they often do. In 1967, the lyric of a popular song went, uh, <clears throat> Love is all around me. In 1977, the lyric of a different song went, uh, Love is in the air. And it's interesting to live for a while. I, I, at this point in my life, and in, in this point in, in uh, our history, I don't sense that love is all around me in this culture anymore. But, uh, but increasingly, I get the sense uh, that Agur has, uh, that stupid is all around me. And I don't say it as a slur, but as a serious consideration. And one of the things I appreciate about Agur here is uh, what is uh, said about the potential of uh, preparing sermons, it's any teaching I I I I as well. Um, but after a while, you can become very, very skilled at preparing sermons that, as the old saying goes, if there were a poison, they couldn't hurt anyone, and if there were a medicine, they couldn't help anyone. It's very refreshing to have one speak with this kind of, of clarity, something we can all understand. And so as we give consideration to um, uh, stupid all around us, for example, how else do you explain a nation spending itself into such debt that it is mortgaging and has already mortgaged uh, the future of many generations to come if the Lord tarries? Where does that kind of selfishness come from? Uh, where does that sense of self-entitlement come from? And uh, how else can you explain additionally a nation's systematic undermining and breaking down of the institutions of marriage and a family within it? Uh, the cornerstones of historically of any stable or prosperous culture. And instead of nurturing those things, with the understanding that solid marriages and family, uh, that they have ever been the mark of an ascending culture or nation in human history. How else do you explain the current madness that is working to normalize transgenderism in the face of nature, in the face of science, in the face of common uh, sense? But Agur's use of the word stupid is a comfort in a way and that it reminds us that stupid exists in every age of human history because people exist in every age of human history. And to remember that it's not unique to us. And Agur wrote this some 3,000 uh, years ago. It's very important uh, to notice, uh, again, the humility that Agur exhibits in his use uh, of the word. He doesn't use it in a sense of uh, them versus us. They're stupid and I'm not. Uh, he's aiming at something uh, far higher than that in imparting this wisdom to us, but he includes himself. Surely, I am more stupid than any man, and I do not have the understanding of a man. That is, he recognizes that he is as capable as any other human being of living an animal-like existence, that he's in need of being rescued from such an existence as much as every other human being around him in life. 
And his instruction won't do us any good this morning unless we approach it with that same uh, humility and that same confession of uh, ignorance as Agur uh, did. When he speaks of his stupidity and lack of understanding, uh, while at the same time referencing his, his fellow man, he's not communicating that he is more stupid or ignorant than other people. It's just a poetic way of expressing the fact that he shares this stupidity and he shares this ignorance with all of mankind. He recognizes it marks every human being in the world. And here we have Agur, not only uh, in him, not only a tremendous humility on display, but an honest self-assessment um, that is uh, increasingly rare in our culture, uh, as rare as humility uh, is in the culture. Well, that then raises the question, what exactly does it mean for a human being to live life on the level of stupid, on the level of an animal, uh, though admittedly, as human beings, vastly superior to animals, which then Agur is uh, intimating makes the tragedy even greater. And he answers the question in verse 3. And the reason Agur gives us for his self-assessment uh, as stupid and ignorant is there in verse 3 when he stopped and he thought about all of the things he can, we cannot know is mere human beings that we would be completely ignorant of in the dark concerning in life without God and without his revelation to us the wisdom and knowledge that without which everything else in life is really uh, trivial and meaningless uh, by comparison. Answers to questions about from the book of Genesis alone. Uh, answers about the origin of the universe, of the heavens, of the earth, of plant life, of animal life, uh, the origin of man the origin of God's institution of marriage, the origin of evil, the origin of sin, the origin of death, the origin of language, the origin of nations in government. And no one can make any ultimate sense of the world that we live in apart from possessing rock-solid, authoritative answers uh, to those questions. It would be to live a profoundly ignorant life. And then there are questions like, why are we here as human beings? How did we get here? What's the meaning and the purpose of life? Why is the world so messed up? Why are we as people so messed up? Why are we so sinful? Why are we so broken? Why are we so fallen? Why do people die? Why does this thing called death exist at all? What happens after death? And then without God's rev revelation, we would be completely in the dark about God himself. We would know nothing about him. If he didn't reveal himself to us, we would know nothing about his nature, what he is really like, as opposed to just depending upon wild speculations of our own concerning him. We would know nothing about truth. We would be completely in the dark about sin and salvation and eternal life, and not only the truth about everlasting life, but the truth about how to live life in this world. In the now, how to experience, as Jesus put it, life more abundantly. We would be completely in the dark in terms of morality, how to live safely, how to speak safely, how to think safely in this fallen world that we live in. And all of this played a very significant part in what C.S. Lewis wrote of his conversion from atheism to Christianity. Of it, he, he wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the rising of the sun, not simply because I can see it, but because by it, I can see everything else. 
Everything else then makes sense. And nothing can make sense in life apart from this revelation. I believe in Christianity as I believe in the rising of the sun, not simply because I can see it, but because by it I can see everything else. Agur, now, without giving us any kind of a spoiler alert in terms of what he's going to say in verses 5 and 6, he declares on behalf of God that, with, that to live without the answer uh, to any and all of those questions is to live a life, again, of profound blindness, to end up living life on the level of an animal. Yes, with greater capabilities than an animal, greater capacities than an animal, greater capacities for knowledge and accomplishment and pleasure than animals, but to live on the level of an animal nonetheless. Someone at this point might cry out to Agur, uncle, I give up, I give up. But Agur doesn't stop because he knows his audience, it's you and me, and he knows mankind, that even at this point, many will remain unconvinced concerning his cure for stupidity, for living an animal-like life. So he continues. And in verse 4, he then provides each of us with a test by which we can legitimately assess our fitness to reject the existence of God and to reject his wisdom and still then hope to live a life above an animal-like existence. And the test is made up of five very simple questions which one who rejects God and his wisdom should be able to readily provide an answer for other than God. And actually should be able to provide an answer for that uh, the questions, the question, the answer to it to be they themselves. And the questions themselves are interesting. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Just a quick show of hands here in the room here. Okay. That is, who is able to move at will between heaven and earth? Who's able to inhabit all at once the expanse, full expanse of the universe? And the correct answer, of course, is God. And the question doing exactly what it's intended to do, and that is to confront us and to awaken us to our uh, comparatively uh, appalling lack of wisdom and power uh, compared to God's wisdom and power. The second question is, who has gathered the wind in his fist? That is, who can control uh, the massive power uh, of nature? And of course, only God can. Who has bound the waters in a garment, which is a poetic way of saying, who holds waters in the clouds? Just another quick, I don't want to rob anyone in here of uh, your glory if you hold water in the clouds on a daily basis. No, okay. Uh, For the recording, uh, let it be known that no one raised their hand. Who has established all the ends of the earth? That is, set the boundaries for land and the boundaries for the seas. Well, only God has. And then he asks, what is his name that is of God? And what is his son's name, if you know? And the answer to this question is the same as the other four, and that is God. What is fascinating is that he declares here, uh, he declares God to have a son. And what is the name of this son? And of course, we know his name to be Jesus. The verse, of course, can really be a shock to most Jewish people who have been taught that God doesn't have a son, never had a son. But clearly, here in this passage, elsewhere in the Old Testament, uh, this is taught in the Scriptures. Psalm 2, for instance, declares that the Messiah will be Uh, the Son of God. Psalm 2, verse 7, I'll read it to you. Uh, I will declare uh, the decree, uh, God uh, 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 declares, the Lord has said to me, you are my Son, speaking to the Messiah, 
Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations for your inheritance and the ends of the earth for your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and you shall dash them to pieces like a potter's vessel. Later in that same uh, psalm, verse 12, kiss the son, the psalmist says, lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. Blessed are those who put their trust in him. Jesus' claim of sonship, uh, of course, never should have taken uh, the Jewish people by surprise at all. Not then uh, and not now. You might remember that Jesus spoke to Nicodemus in chapter 3 of John. He said, no one has ascended to heaven, but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And he closed up that uh, little section of what he was saying with, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, founded on the teaching of the Old Testament. The ignorance of the the Jewish religious leaders at the time of Jesus was in this regard uh, inexcusable. We're told in Luke chapter 22, as soon as it was day, the elders of the people, both chief priests and scribes, came together and they led him, that is Jesus, into their uh, council saying, uh, as they're now trying to try him to find a charge against him uh, to uh, accomplish his crucifixion. They said, if you're the Christ, tell us. But he said to them, if I tell you, you will by no means believe. And if I ask you, you will by no means answer me or let me go. Then he said, hereafter the Son of Man shall sit at the right hand of the power of God. And they all said, are you then the Son of God? And he said to them, you rightly say that I am. And they said, what further testimony do we need? That is for rejecting him, for we've heard it ourselves from his own mouth. And they condemn him in the face of the scriptures, the teaching of the scriptures, and they ought to have known better. We've got these five questions, and they're all reminiscent, of course, of the 77 questions that God posed to Job in those final chapters uh, of that uh, book when Job, under the, you know, the very poor uh, comfort and counsel of his friends, uh, started to say in his great trial, you know, kind of if I was God, if I was God, I, and this and that, and, I, and, and all, and God put a 77 uh, question uh, test to Job, and uh, throughout the entire 77 questions, Job did not an- open his mouth. He couldn't answer uh, a single one. He, he, failed, uh, he failed the God test. Well, uh, Agur has more confidence in us here in that he just poses the five and trusts it'll have accomplished the same thing. And with these questions, Agur not only contends for the existence of God as creator and as the sustainer of the heavens and the earth, but he also exposes the great divide that exists between God and man in terms of God's power and his wisdom. And Agur understands that until man possesses a personal relationship with God, the very thing that we've been created for, and then lives in that relationship with God in accordance to uh, the Word of God, in accordance with God's wisdom, then man will live on the level of an animal. Now, thankfully, neither Agur nor the Holy Spirit leave any man or woman there, confronted with our profound ignorance and, uh, and, and lack of power. But they close with the means by which we might be rescued from this condition, not only of ignorance, but of living an animal-like uh, existence. And so the cure for stupidity is found, he says in verses 5 and 6, is found in the Word of God, in the Bible, which provides us with the revelation that's needed in order to live on the level of uh, wisdom that uh, God intends for us to have, as opposed to on 
uh, the level of an animal. And you notice in verse 5, he describes the Word of God as pure. And it means pure, but it also means tried. It means tested. It means flawless. It means perfect. And certainly every Christian can testify to how our lives have tested the Word and the promises of God and then found them to be exactly as Agur describes them. His Word and His promises to be pure and to be trustworthy and unfailing and to be tested. And one of the things about God's wisdom that is that it works. And it works in the nitty-gritty of this fallen world. It isn't wisdom that's been uh, supplied to us from some uh, isolated ivory tower who's uh, someone living in one of those that is uh, dealing solely in the the realm of, of the theoretical or the philosophical. Christianity works. The wisdom of God works. And as we obey His Word, we do no harm to God, we do no harm to others, we do no harm to ourselves. And it leads us into a life we would never otherwise know. Again, as Jesus stated, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And His Word is so perfect that one comes to conclude concerning it that only God, only the one who has created us could know us this well and know our needs so well as to provide us with this kind of wisdom and instruction. And you notice that his word is not wisdom uh, in, in part, but the whole. You notice that word every. Every word is pure. He describes God's word in verse 5 as a shield to those who trust in him. And this speaks of the security that the word of God brings into our lives, the shield that uh, it is in our our lives, the safety uh, of all of those uh, who trust in his word and in his promises found in the Bible, and then who out of that trust then obey those commandments. I would guess that you're exactly like me uh, as a Christian. Every one of us uh, will probably have spent some time in our life already uh, having uh, spent time thanking God for all of the disasters, all of the regret, all of the addiction, all of the sin, all of the awful decisions that His Word has protected us from. Decisions we were fully capable of making and would have made apart from His Word acting as a shield in our lives. And personally, I shudder at the thought of what my life might have become without the wisdom and the protection of God's Word And I don't think I'm alone in that. And then finally in verse 6, because it is pure, it is tested, it is trustworthy, it is tried, just as it is, he warns against any man who would consider adding to God's Word. And you have so many institutions and churches and individuals who claim an association to God of the Bible, and they do exactly this, and it's always been the case. God has said exactly what He wants to say in His Word. He has a tremendous vocabulary. And He knows what He wants to say, and He knows what He wants to communicate to us, and we don't have to add to it with the idea that we can improve upon it already. The Bible is already perfect as it is. And any time you try to improve upon perfection, uh, you're going to mar that perfection. 
And, and so here is a gore and says, don't add anything to it. If you try to improve it, you're only going to mar it. And so it's to be read, it's to be believed, and, and it's to be taught just as God uh, has said. And the proof for uh, the wisdom uh, is found uh, in the eating of the pudding, in the life that it produces. Uh, Agur warns in this regard, uh, and surely God knows that we need to be warned about this. He warns that if a person adds to God's word, uh, uh, that uh, it will result in his rebuke of us. Uh, It will result in us being exposed uh, as a liar. Again, I can't speak for the sensitivities of anybody else in the room, but I love the candor. I love the vocabulary. I love the worst use of the word liar because it sticks. It gets my attention. Uh, It shocks me on some level so that I can look at it and realize this is serious, serious business. And its clarity is very refreshing. There are similar, similar warnings found elsewhere in the Scriptures. Uh, at the, near the very beginning of the Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 1, I'll read it. Now, O Israel, listen to the statutes and the judgments which I teach you to observe that you may live and go in and uh, possess the land which the Lord your fathers is, uh, Lord God your fathers is giving to you. You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor shall you take anything away from it, that you may keep the commandments uh, of the Lord your God which I command you. Oh, very interesting. He recognizes that the tendency to add to or to take away from the commandments will be to... Uh, find a loophole to keep from obeying the commandments. Book of Revelation, uh, uh, the Apostle John, as he writes it in the warning concerning that book specifically, in Revelation 22, for I testify to everyone who hears the uh, words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds to these things, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book, and if anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the book of life, from the holy city, and the things which are written in the book. And it's intended to frighten us. It's intended to uh, produce a godly fear within us. God's word... And in terms of the handling of God's Word, it's different from everything else in life uh, in the sense that people's eternities are at stake. Their understanding of God is at stake. It's a serious business to claim to represent God and then to add something of my own thinking that is inconsistent with the Scriptures, or to take away what I don't like. And Agur wants uh, that to sit uh, heavy upon us in a good way, in a health-producing way in our lives. And so this ends Agur's uh, kind of initial instruction to his sons, to his pupils, and the Holy Spirit has made us his pupils, so to speak, here this morning, uh, Ithiel and Ukal, and God's instruction here to us as well the beginning of that instruction in chapter 30. I think that this passage, for those of us who are Christians, it certainly produces a, uh, a great cause for joy in our hearts it's, and at the, uh, the animal-like existence that we once lived and we know it. Whatever the body said, we did it. The great, great joy at being rescued from an animal-like existence and then not only uh, that, but then to be delivered not only into everlasting life, but to be delivered into, again, as Jesus put it, a life more abundantly. Now stop for a moment this morning as Christians. 
and to stop and think about what we might have been apart from God's wisdom and power. What we know we would have been and become. And to think about the life that is ours instead and the praise that that produces within our hearts. What I might have been apart from God and His power, His wisdom, the work of His Holy Spirit through His Word. Again, it horrifies me to think about it. And if you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, you might wonder, where in the world does a life like this begin? Where do I begin a life of simple obedience to God? To come under His wisdom in my life, to obey His commandments as He uh, intends uh, for us to do. And it begins by just simply putting your trust in His Son, Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. To look at your life and to say, uh, a gore has me nailed here uh, on this. I don't like the life that I'm living. I don't like the level of the life that I'm living. And I can see, even if it's pleasurable, even if it's all of these other things, I'm living far below what I know life ought to be. And I, and I sense that it can be. And I come to a place where I say, okay, Lord, I'm, I turned the steering wheel of my life over to you. I repent of sin. I repent of my own self-will related to my life. And I give my life to you. I put my faith in Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of my sins. I believe that His death, burial, and resurrection has provided me with the salvation that I need. Take my life and make it yours. And the moment a person does that, this miracle of being born again occurs. The Holy Spirit comes into your life now and He gives you the desire to obey the Word of God and then the power to obey uh, the Word uh, of God. Neither one of those would, would be meaningful at all if they weren't connected together. And God provides both for us. And if you never trusted in Christ for salvation, they're going to be pastors and other men and women up in front immediately after the service, and they would love to pray with you and for you and answer your questions this morning. If you have any need in your life this morning, anybody uh, that you would like somebody to pray for you concerning, they'd love to pray with you and for you as well. Let's stand together now and we'll close in prayer. Father, thank you for this passage. As the chorus goes, we are very happy to be in the truth, in your truth, and to be in a truth that works, that overwhelms and brings illumination to every part of our lives, past, present, and future. Lord, we readily confess our own capacity for stupidity. How stupid we were before coming to know You. Even since, Lord, the capacity for stupid in our life. And thank You for Your Word that provides us a safe place from that. And thank You for Your Son who has provided a way to move from an animal-like existence in this life and into the life that you intend for us. We pray that every single person here that doesn't know you this morning would come into your plan and purposes for their life this morning. And we pray and we thank you and we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.